Welcome to the Bethel Church Sermon of the Week. For more information about this podcast and other resources, visit ibethel.org. Uh, it's good to see you. Good morning, good morning. Eric and Candace send their love. They're in Atlanta. This morning, Chris is in Orlando. And you and me, we're right here. Center of the universe, right here in Redding, California. That's right. Let the whole world know. I have uh, something I need to read to you. Actually, I've read it before, but it's been a while, so. In Mount Vernon, Texas, Drummond's Bar began construction on expansion of their building to increase their business. In response, the local Baptist church started a campaign to block the bar from expanding with petitions and prayers. This is a true story. Work progressed right up until the week before the grand reopening when lightning struck the bar and it burned to the ground. After the bar burnt to the ground by a lightning strike, the church folks were rather smug in their outlook bragging about the power of prayer. That is until the bar owner sued the church on the grounds that the church was ultimately responsible for the demise of his building, either through direct or indirect actions or means. In its reply to the court, the church denied all responsibility or any connection to the building's demise. The judge read through the plaintiff's complaint and the defendant's reply. And at the opening hearing, he commented, I don't know how I'm going to decide this, but it appears from the paperwork that we have a bar owner who believes in the power of prayer and an entire church congregation that now does not. (laughs) That is is so funny. Oh, goodness. (laughs) I want you to uh, open your Bibles to uh, Daniel chapter 10. It'll take me a few minutes to get there, but uh, just go there. Daniel chapter 10. I had a wonderful time this week in Singapore. I left after the service last week and <clears throat> caught a flight. It's kind of funny. I... I uh, this particular event I've done five times and, and uh, they rescheduled everything so that I could fly home Friday in time to be home for my son Brian's birthday. So I, I traveled a lot on my kids' birthdays, not when they were young, but since we've been running. And so I told him a few years ago, I'm not traveling on your birthdays anymore. So Leah's is coming up on the 23rd and Eric's is coming up in May. And So anyway, that's what I told him. So we they rearranged all the schedule and let me come in and fly home Friday morning so I'd get here in time. While I was on the plane, flying to Singapore on Monday, or Sunday night, whatever it was, middle of sometime, <laughs> um, Brian and I are texting, because you now have internet on, the, on a lot of the flights. So we're texting each other, and I said, yeah, I'm on my way to Singapore. He says, oh, wow. He says, I leave for tomorrow for Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> What? You're flying to Singapore? I said, he said, yeah. He says, we, we have an Asian tour. He says, we're doing 10 city concert uh, worship tour. And I went, I, I'm flying home for your birthday on Friday. <laughs> I'm, I, may spend, I worked hard to get there for your birthday, and you're not going to be there. He said, oh, I don't care about that stuff. Said, no, I, I care. I care. I've, I'm flying home. So funny. So, we, we, so he arranged to get a cab and to come over to my hotel before I went to speak. And we spent a little father-son and grandson time. Braden was also there. But Braden was in the middle of a jet lag encounter. <laughs> the encounter of the Lord sticks with you. The jet lag encounter it may mark his life forever. I don't know. I'm not sure. But it was, it was so, so fun to see him. Anyway, that's a little, bit of my, a little bit of my week. Daniel chapter 10. Are you there? 
it'll take me a little bit to get there. I, wanna, I, I actually want to tell you three stories, uh, Bible stories. Uh, Daniel 10 is one of them. Uh, but the first two, um, I like stories in the Bible. They help me. I, I, you know, David and Goliath, that makes sense to me. You know, a little guy with a rock, boom. I like stories because I can see them and it helps me. And the stories reveal so much about God's nature, the way he interacts with people, with human beings, with mankind. And so I, I just, I've always loved the stories. And uh, I was thinking about three stories. Uh, the third one we'll look at here. But three stories this morning that are unusual to me. The, the first would be Moses. Israel is fighting against the Amalekites. It's in Exodus um, 17, I think. And they're, they're fighting. And Moses would stand up on this hill while they're down in the valley fighting Israelites and Namo, or Amalekites are fighting, killing each other. And as long as Moses stood with his hands raised, Israel would win. When he would get tired, which is normal, he would get fatigued, he'd put his hands down to rest, Israel would lose. And Aaron and Hur, uh, Aaron the high priest and Hur, they, would, they came and they, they put themselves under his shoulders. They actually put rocks to posture him to hold his hands up. And then they sat there and held his arms so that they could hold him the whole time until Israel won the battle. It's, lessons like that are really helpful for me because they, they help to reinforce the idea that many of us have that physical obedience brings a spiritual release. There's somehow a connection between what we do in the natural here and what happens there. It doesn't talk about angelic forces being released, but uh, that would be the normal way anyway that I would see it done. We see it described elsewhere in Scripture where angels would be released into a situation. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about angels today. It's not really my subject, but we'll dance around it a little bit. They're not talked about a lot in the, in the Western church. I'm not sure why. Maybe because... Uh, some people get weird and they worship them and talk to them and command them. And I, I'm, I'm not interested in that. I, I just want to talk to you about the reality that Jesus spoke of. In Hebrews 1, it says, angels were sent out to render service on behalf of those who would inherit salvation. Now, everybody in this room that is born again, you were saved at a certain time, certain moment. You're, you placed your faith in Christ and you were forgiven of sin. You were born again. But the scripture also teaches that you are right now being saved. And there's a day that Jesus is going to return and you're going to be saved. You, you were, you are, and you will be. And those are the three dimensions of all of our salvation. And so this says that angels have been dispatched to render service for those who will inherit salvation. I don't know, when I look at this story, I see... I see a physical action of hands raised and I see two men that came to support him because of natural fatigue. And as long as they kept the right posture, there was a victory. I remember my dad, my dad used to quote um, Timothy where Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, lift up your hands without wrath or doubting. And he would say, without wrath means don't get mad about it. Without doubting means don't question what good it does. Just do what he said to do. And sometimes there's just that posture. We just take that posture before the Lord. Unfortunately, in, in the Western church that becomes very concept-oriented instead of experience, many times things get reduced to an inward feeling and not a physical action. Like, I, I feel humble, so why should I kneel? I, I feel happy, so why should I dance? I, I feel... The, the attitude of faith, so why should I take risk? And everything gets reduced to this internal stuff that really needs to be uh, outwardly manifest. I, 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 it doesn't do my relationship with my wife a lot of good if I tell her, well, I, honey, I feel the love in my heart. I don't need to say it. I don't need to display it. That's not going to work very well in my household. I don't know about yours, but I'm just telling you in my family, this is the way it works. Things need to actually be put into an action. They need to be put in word form. They need to be put into actions. Why? Well, according to what the Scripture shows us, there's, there's a relationship between physical actions here and spiritual realities and releases there. 
And so here's Moses with his hands up. And as long as his hands were up, Israel would win. The second story is, is, I find it an interesting story. It's with Elisha and his servant. His servant comes in the house one day and says, we're, I'm going to put it in my language. Mr. Prophet, we're in big trouble. We are surrounded by a huge army. And Elisha says, we're not in big trouble. And he says, uh, do not fear. Those who are with us are more than those who are against us. And then Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountains were full of the horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Great story. That one is in 2 Kings 6, verse 16. And the other one I read to you is Exodus 17, verse 8, if you're writing notes. So here's this great story. The prophet is in his home, and, and he has this habit of, of announcing what the enemy is about to do, and then they suffer a loss in a battle, and they're not real happy with Elisha, so they want to kill him. So this army surrounds Elisha, and he's just sitting in his recliner or whatever he happened to have at that time. And the young man comes to him and says, we're in trouble. And he says, we're not in trouble. He says, yeah, the armies are all around us. And he says, Lord, open his eyes. Here's the deal. It doesn't tell us that Elisha saw the angelic armies. Now, he may have, but he was inside. And I've got this sense that Elisha grew to understand what accompanied him every time he said yes to his assignment. There's something that the Lord does to reinforce the believing believer who is embracing the commission of the Lord. There is an angelic assistance, an angelic host to help. It's foolish to worship angels. It's equally foolish to ignore them. They are a part of the equation. I don't like the idea of bossing them around. I hear some people, they command them to do this and that. Not for me, not for me. What I'd rather do is to hear what God is saying and just declare it. And I hope that they pay attention to what was declared because their job is to enforce what God is saying. So that's, that's as far as I take it. I just, I just listen to the Lord. If I can catch what he's saying, then I start declaring. But sometimes we're one declaration short of a personal breakthrough. It's not good enough that it just stays in my heart as, well, I just believe it. Well, I just claim it. Some things have to be spoken for them to actually take place. It's fascinating to me, the whole interaction between angels and God and angels and man. I don't, I don't get it, but I, I see it clearer than I used to. Um, there's this scripture in Psalms 104, I think it is, that says that God rides upon the wind. Does anybody remember that passage? God rides upon the wind. It's on the left side of the page, second column, about this far down. God rides upon the wind. Well, here's an interesting thing. In Hebrews 1, uh, is quoting an Old Testament passage that describes angels as ministers of wind and ministers of fire. So just follow through the reasoning with me. Angels are called ministers of wind, ministers of fire. Does anyone remember at least one time when both wind and fire showed up in the same room? It was on the day of Pentecost, 120 in the upper room. I'm, I'd like to suggest to you there was an intense amount of angelic activity in the room, so much so it began to spill over into natural manifestation around the 120 that were being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So here's this, the room just becomes filled. I've, I've been in the room when you can, you start to sense the, I don't know what to call them, the whirlwinds of God. We've had the wind, we've seen the, the things happen because the room just gets filled with the angelic presence. And people say, well, we don't, we don't want angels, we want God. No, you want whatever God wants. Yeah, I, I won't boss angels around, but I especially won't boss God around. You know? <laughs> and what I, the, the, the picture that comes to me is it says, all right, the angels are ministers of wind, but Psalms 104 says he rides upon the wind. So is it possible that when the angelic realm is released to render service, that God is actually riding on that wind? In other words, they usher him in, which is what we all want. We want him ushered into the situation. He can come any way he wants. People say, well, we don't need angels. We've, we've got the power of God. You know, 
You just use what he's using. He don't need you either. <laughs> you don't need me. He can preach the gospel without us a lot better than with us. But he's chosen. See, everything he made, he made with divine purpose. Everything finds its identity. Everything finds its esteem, if I can use self-esteem in, in a godly sense. Everything that God has made finds its self-esteem by stepping into their purpose. That includes the angelic host. And so when Gabriel brought a message to Mary, she was going to give birth to the Christ child, yes, God could have told her himself. But he chose to use this created being called Gabriel for the reason he was created. That was to carry the messages of God. And so God, not wanting to violate the design of his own creation, sent an angel. So anyway, anyway. Angels are often used in this assignment. So here's this picture. I don't know, I don't personally think that Elijah, Elisha saw the angels surrounding his home, outnumbering the natural army. I, I can't prove it, but my, my conviction is, is that through his lifetime of trust with God, he learned what was assigned to him, and he lived with the awareness of that heavenly host that accompanied him everywhere. Why would he have to have a huge army that would surround him? Because it equaled his assignment. One more thing I want to just address before we get into Daniel 10. There's a statement going around um, that annoys me. It's, it's true, but it annoys me. It's true in part, it annoys me. Higher levels, higher devils. Basic, it basically, it says, you don't want to grow up because you'll face bigger problems. Well, let's, let's be practical. Who has more soldiers surrounding them, the private or the general? Higher levels, yeah, maybe higher devils, but my goodness, higher angelic participation as well. It's like... It's, it's just sometimes we do so many, never mind, so many stupid things. All right, let's leave it right there. Let's, let's move on to Daniel. So here, here's two stories. All I'm trying to do is illustrate angelic involvement in strategic moments in history. And we've got a real fascinating one here that helps me to see how the unseen world functions when we pray. All right? So Daniel chapter 10. Verse 2, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Jump over to verse 10. Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. We're going to read this whole verse again, but I want you to catch this beginning phrase right at the beginning. It says, he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved. Here's a, a real interesting concept that I want to pull out of this story before we move on. In verse 3, he says, I ate no pleasant food. The word pleasant there is the word desirable. I ate no desirable food, which sounds like a vegetarian diet to me. <laughs> no. uh, that just slipped out. For all you vegetarians that are part of our, this church, you have applied continuous forgiveness towards me for years, and I bless you. All right, back to this. I ate no pleasant food. I ate no desirable food. Now, here's what's interesting. In verse 11, he says, O Daniel, man greatly beloved. The word greatly beloved is the exact same word that described desirable food. In other words, O Daniel, man found to be very desirable. Wow. So good. Wow. I ate no desirable food. I became the man greatly desired. 
All right. There's a difference between God's love and God's favor. God's love is 100% full on towards you 24 7. A hundred million years from now, it won't be any more than it is now. And it's not more now or less now than when you were born. It is full on, complete, absolute, perfect love towards you all the time. Favor is different. Favor is initially given as a gift, but its increase is dependent upon our stewardship. It almost sounds like you buy more favor. That's, that wouldn't be accurate, but you also don't get it without sacrifice. The increase of favor comes through the proper use of favor. So here we have this story where Daniel feeling the weightiness of the destiny of his nation, determines I'm going to set aside all that I would normally be blessed with, thrive with in my own life. I'm going to set aside all that is desirable, and I'm going to seek the Lord. And so he takes three weeks where he fasts and he prays. And the Lord's response was, Oh, Daniel, you who have been found to be greatly desirable. What is this? It's a picture of unusual increased favor. Using favor to deny oneself and not benefit from what you have earned is a huge part of demonstrating maturity. In our homes, it would look like this. At Christmas time, if you don't have enough to buy gifts for yourselves as adults, you make sure there's enough for your children. You, you go without to make sure they have. That's what you do when you grow up. Five-year-olds will demand their rights. <laughs> and sometimes our spiritual age is revealed by us demanding our rights. Yes, son, you have a right to eat. You go ahead and eat. But there are times where in the things of the Lord, there are critical moments where there's to be a partnership with heaven. And and sometimes it just simply means vegetables only. I did a Daniel fast once. It, it, was, it was torture. It was torture. It was just easier to skip food altogether than to eat something that was a warm-up for meat. Now, excuse me while I digress, but on my plate, I eat one thing at a time. If I have steak, potatoes, broccoli, corn, I eat corn first, because it just, excuse me, I, eat, uh, I, was, th- I was thinking uh, carrots. I eat the carrots first because it doesn't fit with anything. Then I eat the broccoli. I eat it till it's all gone. Then I eat the potato because it's immersed in butter. And then I end with a grand finale of meat. That's, I, I don't mix it. I don't take one bite of this, one bite of that. I finish one thing at a time because there is a crescendo. There is a target. There is... There is the grand finale, the end of my meal. And to eat just vegetables is like there's no grand finale. I warmed up and I'm facing disappointment. (laughs) It's really true. It was a miserable feast. Fast, fast, fast. Miserable fast. All right, now let me get back to serious things. (laughs) I'm I'm such a horrible faster. I, I do it good. I, I do it good in this sense. If the Lord's called us to fast, I say yes, done. I'm not, I'm not tempted to put steak in a blender until it's liquid. <laughs> I, I don't do a juice fast of, uh, you know, pineapple and apples and everything and then beef and, you know, I, I, if, I, if I lock into a fast, I'm there and I'm not tempted to, to break. However, I religiously watch the Food Channel planning the rest of my life <laughs> because it feels like I'm dying 
and and I'm 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 pretty sure that it's the will of God. And and my my last my last extensive fast was a long one it was years ago, and I, I bought 29 cookbooks <laughs> on that 40 day fast. 29 cookbooks, <laughs> and I don't cook. And what's really dumb is two of the cookbooks I bought the last time I fasted. <laughs> and so Leah inherited two of the cookbooks on the last one because we, I didn't do two, set, two sets. I'm buying, I buy them hoping the people around me who cook will be inspired, as I was, to buy them. It's, it's, it's pitiful. There's something that God recognizes in heaven about the physical response, the external obedience of the raised hands, bowing low, getting on knees. It would be horrible to do any of that stuff to put on a show, but it's equally horrible to withhold from him physical response. It's hor horrible. Many people don't have health problems or financial health problems. They have lordship problems. The lordship of Jesus is at the root of many, many things that we deal with in life. And so here's this moment where I don't know, there's no evidence of the Lord speaking to Daniel, at least that I recognized, about this fast, but he just chose to set aside what was desirable. And after, and he mourned, so he was not in a positive, you know, Hype. It was not a hype moment for him. He was in mourning, fasting, and praying. But something happened before God's eyes where the favor of God on Daniel's life, diet, life increased. And the Lord looked at him and said, Daniel, you've rejected, I'm, I'm going to put my language, you've turned away from the desirable. In doing so, you've become extremely desirable. <laughs> to have the Lord say that over you, over me, there's, there's somehow there's an exchange, there's a connection. And so we have this great verse. Let's read verse uh, uh, 11 again. He says, he said to me, Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you. Stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. And then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. And I have come to make known to you, or make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. Stop right there. Here's this, here's this, um, uh, a story, a story that illustrates a man who prays, what happens in God's response and the conflict that took place between the release of God's answer and Daniel's discovery or realization of the answer. Daniel's praying for 21 days and the scripture says, an angel comes to him and says, I was released to come to you 21 days ago, the first time you prayed. But I was withheld in a battle with the prince of Persia. Now, when we talk about the prince of Persia, we're talking about a principality that rules over a region of the world in darkness. I was withheld by the prince of Persia. So here's an angel on the way to bring an answer to Daniel. And the principality of that area rises up to stop the, the, angel, uh, the, the angel that was bringing the answer. And Daniel continues to pray, and eventually Michael, the archangel, is released to assist this angel so that he can be freed to bring the answer. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't get any more graphic than that for us to understand what is happening in the unseen world. It's so helpful for me to see why you persist in prayer. We persist in prayer not to persuade God. We persist in prayer because we change in the process, and there are spiritual environments that change in the process. God's revealed will is clear in Scripture, but sometimes we don't experience it 
because we don't understand what's happening in the unseen world. We pray once, it doesn't happen. We confess it a few times, fast a day or whatever, and, and we don't seem to get the breakthrough. Daniel here models something that is so beautifully illustrated that I can, I can never think about persistent prayer the same way again. He continues in prayer, and Michael, one of the three archangels, there are three that are re, uh, revealed in Scripture, Michael, is the warring angel, Gabriel, the messenger angel, and Lucifer. Lucifer, of course, fell and was booted out of heaven. And so now there are two remaining angels uh, in this, two remaining archangels that help to oversee all that takes place. So here's Michael released, and he brings deliverance to this angel that was assigned to bring the message. I don't know... Uh, this, this fascinates me. God, God likes using everything he made. He likes using you. He likes using me. He loves partnership. If he didn't like partnership, he wouldn't have created everything that he created. If he didn't like co-laboring, he wouldn't leave the ministry of the gospel up to you and me to take to the ends of the earth. But instead, he likes that co-labor. He loves that drawing near to his creation so that what is, is uh, uh, transferable about his own nature, about his own person, comes upon that believer that's yielded to preach with power, to see great things happen in the earth. So here's Daniel. He prays for 21 days. At the end of 21 days, the angel is released and brings him the message. I wonder how many times we've had an, a an answer sent to us. I don't know, I'm wondering. It, it almost implies it's possible for it not to make it if the answer would be released and never actually make it to us. The purpose for answers to prayer, I, I know that sometimes the Lord just answers, boom, like that, we pray, something happens. I, I don't know. I, I don't want to make the devil more powerful than he is. I, I don't want us to think, well, I pray and, you know, God's just not powerful enough to get me the answer. That would be kind of silly. But sometimes he actually, let me put it this way. God uses all of creation for his purposes. He even uses the devil for his purposes. He does. The devil doesn't win any argument. He doesn't have the last say in any situation. Everything he has ever done and ever will do, God will have the final say on, and it will actually end up bringing him more glory. The devil is a pawn on a chessboard that God can use at will. It is not God warring with the devil. If there were a fight between God and the devil, the devil would be dissolved in milliseconds. All he would have to do is cross his eyes at him, and he'd be gone. <laughs> There is no war between God and the angelic. There is a war, or demonic. There is a war between the angelic and the demonic. And you and I get to vote who wins. We get to vote who wins. We stand with arms held high. In, in moments when he's dealing deeply with us, we kneel, we bow low, we put our face on the ground. Why? There's something about making manifest what is happening inside of me. It's not good enough that I just contain my warm, fuzzy feelings in here. They must be displayed. They must take on declaration, decree for us. They must come in the embrace, in the bowing low, in the dance, in the shout, whatever it might be. And you and I get to vote as to what happens in that second heaven. And so we stand with arms high and heart abandoned. It's just what we do. The battle that takes place in the heavenlies. You have influence. You have influence in as glorious and as incredible a man of God that Moses was. He didn't have what you have. John the Baptist was called the greatest of all Old Testament prophets. 
put all their names there. John was the greatest. But the least in the kingdom, least in the New Testament reality of the fullness of the Spirit of God is greater in the sense of what is possible through your life than even John the Baptist or Elijah or Moses. That's not a point of arrogance. It's a point of accountability. I have, to whom much is given, much is required. I uh, have been toying with this subject for a, a little while and just it felt appropriate to bring it up today. And when I was uh, praying in here early this morning, I got a text from Eric. And Eric told me, uh, Lauren is going to talk to you. Uh, I was gone all week, so I didn't have a chance to interact with the staff. <clears throat> so Lauren's going to talk to you because uh, uh, about a coming fast that we feel the church is supposed to take, we're supposed to take as a church. And, uh, and so here I'm, I'm, I'm working on this thing to talk to you about, and then I get this text, and Lauren comes to me and says, some of the leadership team felt this week that we were to prepare the church for a fast. It's a seven-day seven day fast beginning in, I think, April 2nd. And anyway, the point was, is here, I'm carrying this thing about us putting aside the desirable yeah. to increase our place of favor and place of breakthrough. And then I get this text from Eric in a conversation with one of the team what some of our leadership has been feeling. So I guess the point I want to make is, I'm happy with where we are. I'm thankful for where we are. I'm thrilled with what I've been seeing. And I'm so horribly unsatisfied because I have seen farther down the road. And what is farther down the road is what I'm alive for. Now, what we're experiencing now is what I was alive for 10 years ago. But it's changed. I am now alive for what's further down the road. And uh, so we're going, to, we're going to summons you as a church family. I realize not everybody can do it um, um, for different health reasons, physical reasons, but for those who can, join us. So we're going to take some time just to set aside, to seek the face of the Lord, to humble ourselves, to see what he might just increase in the coming days. I, I feel like there's some breakthroughs. I feel like there's just some breakthroughs um, that are like that far away. They're at hand. They're at hand. And uh, we just need a, a few folks kind of tilting the table in our direction uh, that I, I, I think the Lord is really going to honor. So you'll be hearing more about that in the days to come. So here's what I want to do. We're going to pray. I, I, my, my approach to life is feast, 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 and then God says fast, then I fast. But the rest of the time, it's feast, 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 feast. <laughs> I'm a very thankful celebrator of the good things of God. I'm in feast. I don't live in fast mode. I live in feast mode. But um, sometimes as adults, we have to do what adults do. You don't buy the Christmas gift for yourself. You buy it for your kids. And so we've got a whole generation. I tell you what, I, my heart aches for a fresh and mighty outpouring on our children, on our youth. And that is a primary focus for me right now in my own personal prayer time. And so I want to throw that into the mix as we pray. We've got a lot of things to pray for, for our nation. Um, uh, we'll, we'll talk more later. I, I don't want to get too, too strange on you, but we'll, 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 get, we'll give you more details in the future. So, but I want to pray for that release of grace over you. Let's go ahead and stand. We'll wrap this up. So you know, sometimes sometimes we we benefit from other people's breakthrough. And for some, it's become a lifestyle. For example, there have been people in this room that have cried out, fasted, prayed for years. Many breakthroughs happen. And somebody else comes in that has not fasted 10 minutes in their lifetime. 
and they're in the room when the breakthrough comes, they're a part of it, and they think it has everything in the world to do with them. <laughs> Probably a greater example is I, I, I love when the church is just worshiping like crazy, offering to the Lord the sacrifice of thanksgiving, the sacrifice of praise, and it's a special moment to be able to be still in that moment and just be surrounded with all these worshiping people. Maybe sit on the front row and just kind of soak in that presence. It's a great privilege. But if that's your lifestyle, you're sucking off of somebody else's sacrifice. I could have said it more gently. I don't know why it came out that way. I really felt good in my heart when I said it. It just came out kind of ornery. So, you know, forgive me in advance. But it's what children do. Children live benefiting from other people's choices. At some point, maturity has to kick in where we realize, I'm going to give the sacrifice. I'm going to put away what's desirable. I am going to pay the price. Why? Because I want us to obtain a breakthrough that everyone benefits from. It's <laughs> okay, that's probably enough. Yes, indeed. I think I, well, it's good I could end on a positive note. I just wanted to, I'm here just to encourage. That's all I'm here for. <laughs> now, let me pray for you. I want to pray for that real, that real mantle of breakthrough to come upon our lives so that we know how, how to delight in what is desirable and when to say no, that we could increase in our own place of favor. So, Father, that's the cry. We don't know what we're doing, but we really love to honor you. We love to please you. We love to serve you. And so I'm asking right now in the wonderful name of Jesus that you would release that breakthrough anointing, that grace for fasting, that grace to turn away from the desirable, that grace to really become more hungry for what we can't see than what we can see, what we can see. More hungry for you than everything else around us. That anointing and grace as you'd give to us as a family, that we could see an entire generation in this city swept into the kingdom of God. Literally, that every child, every young person, every young adult, there would be this massive harvest of souls that would be released through this, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Sermon of the Week. This weekly podcast is now being translated in several languages. Visit podcasts.ibethel.org.